Okay, in the following uh, eight minutes, I'm going to talk about the work that our research group has been doing in cervical deformity and classification. And then, uh, very importantly, uh, rather than just showing you the classification we have, I'm going to show you some issues with it that are really hot topics for us to try to kind of bring you up to speed as to what we're doing in our research group. If you have an interest, we recently published a book on this. Um, when we were confronted with this issue in our research group about five to ten years ago, uh, our group had done really tremendous work in thoracolumbar classification, thoracolumbar correlation, thoracolumbar alignment planning. We really had no idea, though, how to make sense of the varying morphologies of cervical deformity. Combined coronal deformity, sagittal deformity, what drove uh, improved outcomes, what caused disability, what actually radiographically and morphologically produced these head positions, what was actually going on. And so this is how we came into it. And this was the case that we all knew, okay, this is a cervical deformity. Uh, everyone said, okay, a high risk of three-column osteotomy is justified. This patient has a rigid chin on chest. But as you get deeper into the water here, you realize it becomes a bit muddier. This patient also has a fixed deformity. Uh, he has a rigid fused spine uh, from a prior uh, infection and a prior surgery. And you can see his head is translated forward. And to correct his cervical deformity, you'd also need a three-column osteotomy to do that, uh, to correct his translated head position. And then finally, this patient. This patient also had a long fusion for prior AIS. She's actually fused to the pelvis. And uh, she had an extension for PJF uh, very early on. And you can see she's also translated forward. And to correct her, because of her prior fusion, she's also going to need a three-column osteotomy. And these patients, when you first look at them, you think they don't even have a cervical deformity. But the reason they appear that way is that they're using compensation to hide it. And if you ask them to assume a position of comfort, it uncovers their cervical deformity. And this we call the flat neck patient. Essentially, they're hiding their deformity with retroversion, if you will, of the occipital cervical junction. So it becomes much, much muddier the deeper you get into it, and the more you really look for it, what you see in your own practice is you start doing more and more complicated operations to get these patients sagittally uh, realigned. So one of the first things we wanted to do was take a, a more scientific approach to this problem and say, we're, gonna, we're putting these patients through these big operations. What is actually the health impact of cervical deformity? We found, actually, it was quite substantial. So th these patients are as, uh, as disabled as patients with emphysema and even blindness and low vision. So it is something that at a population level impacts population health, impacts patients, and causes severe disability. It's worth studying, and it might be worth spending some money on. This was a deep dive that we did with Johnson & Johnson. We didn't have access to these industry databases that are very expensive. They did a deep dive for us looking at utilization in the United States. What they found was that the incidence of long fusion for uh, deformity has been rapidly increasing, much more than for non-deformity cases in the cervical spine. So from, a, from a population health standpoint problem, it's a big issue uh, with respect to, um, to affecting patients. Also importantly, when we looked at this to develop a classification, we realized that patients are, many of them are actually kyphotic at baseline. So simply saying kyphosis itself is pathologic is actually not true. We have to do, go much deeper. So we first looked at the impact of pelvic incidence in producing the normal spinal morphology, and what we found was that higher PI patients at baseline have more cervical lordosis. So when you correct your patients, one of the first take-home points is look at the pelvic incidence. If they have high PI, they need more cervical lordosis, and their T1 slope is higher at baseline. We then did a correlation analysis to the cervical sagittal plane, and much like what Glassman found, we found significant correlation to the C2 plumb line. We did a regression, and we found four centimeters as the cutoff to moderate to severe disability, and this became one of the original um, clinical impact factors that we used to base our classification. Here it is in kind of diagrammatic form. You can see a higher T1 slope requires more cervical lordosis to balance the head. If you don't match the cervical lordosis to the T1 slope, you develop significant cervical sagittal imbalance. We then did a regression trying to find a PI LL equivalent in the cervical spine. This is how we did it. Uh, we did a correlation to moderate to severe disability. We found the cutoff value of 22 degrees. And these are a couple of examples of varying uh, degrees of the chin brow vertical angle modifier. We also looked at uh, pelvic tilt. Uh, 
Uh, and this is the C1, C2 hyperlordosis. We found that patients that had more than uh, 32 degrees of cervical lordosis had a significant increase in their neck pain scores. So when we correct these patients, what we want to see is relaxation of their C1, C2 level. Otherwise, we haven't fully removed their compensation. And so this is what we arrived at. Uh, we have deformity descriptors on the left and on the right. Uh, we have modifiers that are directly correlated uh, to cervical uh, disability scores. And again, this is a work in progress. In the next couple minutes, or next minute, I'll tell you uh, what our issues are. One issue we have in our current classification is that mild deformity, and what's important to patients with mild deformity, is very different from what's important and driving disability in patients with severe deformity. So maybe we need different classifications for mild versus severe. Furthermore, these patients have extremely high complication rates. And when we do correlations to try to build a classification, because they have such high complication rates, the complications themselves impact the post-operative scores. So if you want to do a correlation of post-operative alignment to post-operative disability, it's too confounded in the cervical population by the disability scores. And finally, when we build a classification, it's very important to have an instrument that talks to us about what's important to these patients. We do not have an SRS-22C, something that looks at multiple domains of neck health. We only have the neck disability instrument. So finally, just to bring you guys up to the latest where we are, we're now using AI-based clustering in our database, and the computer has identified three different subtypes based upon the entire North American uh, prospective cervical deformity database, and essentially this is what the computer found. You basically have three types of patients. You have the flat neck patient on the left with cervical sagittal balance. Incidentally, just this year we're, we're presenting to the SRS uh, that these patients do best with anterior-posterior surgery. I don't have that slide here, but this is what we submitted to the SRS this year. And this was a subtype identified by the computer using AI. In the middle, these patients need three column osteotomies, obviously. And on the right, these are the more flexible patients with cervical kyphosis. And last year, we won the NAS Value Award for a paper that showed that this morphotype of patients do best with just anterior surgery alone. And I'll finish with that. Thank you very much.